Uh, who's feeling warmer today? Last, last week was about minus 5. Today we're 35, heading toward 40. So it's a wonderful day to be out. And again, we got an excellent crowd. And it's a good day to come out and, and participate in the Hashing Over History, our sesquicentennial year. I always repeat that this is a partnership between the Thousand Island Museum, the Clayton Historian's Office, the Sesquicentennial Committee, and the Clayton Opera House, the TPAP. Uh, we're all working together to bring you these wonderful programs. And no matter how hard we work, if we don't have wonderful speakers, our program is not as successful as we want it. Uh, if you've been around Clayton for any number of years, you know Maryland, you know the Corbin uh, Studios, and today we're going to learn a little bit about Maryland and what she wishes to share. And she will talk about what's around the room at some point, but if she doesn't, I know she will, but uh, <laughs> before you leave today, do a walking tour. And also, when you leave today, your homework is to contact three other individuals that are not here today and make sure they're here next week. So with that, Marilyn, the time is yours. <laughs> Hello. Morning. Welcome, everyone. While I am not myself a native-born Clayton person, I have spent my whole life here. My grandma was born in a little house on Merrick Street. My great-grandfather, George Jr., had a sister, Mary Ann, who married Gardner Skinner. Their father was George Sr., who lived on Water Street and for a time was a sea captain for 30 years, and then later in life, a captain on the lakes. I spent every summer living on Bluff Island and until I was 19 years old, and then I married my husband, Alan Hutchinson of Clayton, 54 years ago in Christ Church here in Clayton. I feel doubly blessed to have my great-grandma's diaries and Les Corbin's photos to tell you a bit of my history. Some of you have heard a story I'm going to tell, the, heard it from me before, but I'm going to tell it again because it's amazing. I have a couple of short stories taken from Great Grandma's Diaries. I have from 1898 to 1904 and 1911 and 1912. Yes the burning of the Frontenac on Round Island, August 23rd, 1911. She wrote that entry in her diary by the light of the fire. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> that gave me chills, it still does. <laughs> Life in Clayton in these diaries was very interesting, full of dinners, card parties, by the way, this is a one of the card games that was very popular in the early 1900s, Bezique. <laughs> I had to send to Australia for that. <laughs> and a lot of dancing around town in the different hotels. Lots of names in the diaries that are still here with us and among us today. Don't anybody get nervous. I, I, <laughs> I make no <laughs> judgments. <laughs> In addition to the two short stories that I want to tell, I would also like to share with you some of Les Corbin's history. As you have noticed, I'm sure, over the past couple of days, my husband and I have installed an exhibit taken from Les's collection. It will remain here throughout the sesquicentennial for your enjoyment. Okay, the first story is about May and the muskie that she caught. <laughs> she caught that muskie 
<laughs> with a Skinner spoon. <laughs> but perhaps what isn't such common knowledge is the factory making the spoons when it was in Clayton was on James Street next door to where Grant Deer Insurance is located. May and her husband Gardner lived next door to the factory on the property that Grant Deer has his business at. My great-grandfather, George Hill Jr., was Gardner's factory manager for many years. The coming of the railroad to Clayton in 1873 made it possible for great-grandpa to make the journey to Chicago in 1894 to present the Skinner Spoon on behalf of Gardner for an exhibit at the Columbian Exposition of the World's Fair. The Chicago World's Fair would have two main zones. One part of it was made up of 14 exhibition buildings dedicated to modern achievements <laughs> in arts and industry. The other section of the fair was a mile-long midway carnival of amusements. The fair awarded the Skinner Spoon, and I have the award right here, This is the certificate of achievement great grandpa returned home with to present to Gardner. For those of you who aren't familiar maybe with the Skinner Spoon, they came in a lot of various sizes. These are kind of beat because they're well used. I love the quote I found in History of Child's Gazetteer, 1890. Besides being attractive lures, they are uniformly made as to win the confidence of the angler and withstand the struggles and throes of greedy and powerful fish. <laughs> yeah, that was good. Okay, so that takes care of May Skinner to some degree. She was a real close friend of my great-grandma's. I put a picture of great-grandma here. Oh. <laughs> the next story I'd like to do takes place on Calumet. And before I begin this story, I'd like to give you a brief history of the relationships involved. My great-grandma, Mary Hill of Merrick Street, had a sister, Maggie. Maggie was married to Edward Rogers. Actually, I didn't put this in here, but Edward's brother, Frank, in addition to being an author, uh, was editor of the, on the St. Lawrence for a time, the newspaper. Um, so Maggie, married to Edward, was pregnant with three children, Frankie, Anna, and Elsie. They lived on Calumet Island in the caretaker's home, which is this one. The caretaker's home uh, was Edward, I'm sorry, Edward was the caretaker of the island summer home of Charles Emery. Mr. Emery, of course, was a tobacco tycoon from New York City and owned land on several islands as well as in Clayton. A young woman, 25 years old, Minerva Robbins, worked for Edward and Maggie as a nanny to their children. You know, I wanted to pass these around 
they're, they're both alike, so just send them in different directions. She was a nanny to the children, and she lived with them. Her parents lived on Grindstone Island, Captain and Mrs. John Robbins. The original building on Calumet was a wooden structure. He had, <clears throat> he had that removed from Calumet, probably over the ice, and placed on Picton Island. In its place, the castle was built. My story takes place on December 25th, 1896. Minerva asked Edward if she could go home to be with her family for Christmas Day. Edward and eight-year-old Frankie and Minerva left Calumet in a punt to head for Grindstone. Maggie and her girls went up to the top floor of their house to watch Edward as he headed for Eagle Wing Shoal. Between the wind and the ice and the waves, she watched as the punt took on water and sank out of sight. Alone, pregnant, with two little girls, what could she do? The only thing she could do was to raise the flag on the flagpole, upside down, half-mast, a universal sign of distress, and wait. All through the night, she waited until morning daylight. Early that morning, the Catholic priest, who was at the Clayton train station, waiting for a train to take him to Lafargeville, noticed the flag upside down and recognized it for distress. He ran to his church, rang the church bells. Clayton folk and Grindstone Islanders all responded. And for nearly a week, they searched for the bodies. At times, 30 to 40 skiffs could be seen out on the water, dragging for the bodies. Charles Emery, when he got word of the disaster, offered $5 a day to any man that would help in the search. This is 1898. He took a, it took a week for all the bodies to be recovered from depths of 30 to 90 feet in the water. First, Minerva was recovered. Then, Edward, Maggie's husband. And then, little Frankie, eight years old. Charles Emery made another very generous offer. He set Maggie and her girls up at, in a house at 115 Water Street where she could run a boarding house to support herself and her girls. The baby she was carrying was also a girl and she named her after her husband Edward, Edwina. Some of you may recall Edwina from her married name Edwina Fitzgerald. She had a son, Robert, who eventually became a dentist and worked alongside Doc Eppolito. <laughs> the boarding house eventually belonged to Grace and Vic Failing, but burned down along with several other homes, Melzer Hutchinson's and the Rice House, in a fire in 1963. Was Edwina Fitzgerald the teacher? She teach school? Did she teach school? Yeah. Okay. So that's that story. Now I would like to talk to you about Les Corbin. One last last thing about uh, Mr. Emery yes. was 
his money. How rich he was. Oh. He was the guy that invented the cigarette rolling machine and <laughs> leased and sold it to the other company. So that's where his money came from. Yeah, he had money. <laughs> in land, he owned Picton, he owned the land on Round, the land here in town. Yeah. <laughs> yes, is that house on Picton, the house for you? Heinemann's, yes. Oh, okay. I heard that, I'm sure. Yes. And then there's its tale of how he wanted to buy all the downtown Titans. Yep, so he could turn the buildings around to face him on Kelly <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that'd be nice. It would have been there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I have since decided to use a phrase or two that my father-in-law preferred. The past will always be part of the future. Or even more appropriate for a man who spent his life doing it, preserving the past for the future. The history of Clayton has been captured in many ways. One person who preserved this history was Les Corbett. His avenue of preservation was through photography. Known as the Dean of Thousand Island Photographers, he dedicated his life to taking his own photography and restoring the collections previous Clayton photographers, such as Huffstadter, Hardy, and Breslow, all left to him in his very capable hands. Les was the youngest son of Maud and Ernest Corbin of Clayton. He had two older brothers, Howard and Harold. Ernest had several downtown businesses, a bakery, a newsstand, a grocery store, and eventually a general store. Actually, where Michael Ringer's located was Toyland. That was Ernest. I remember my mother-in-law telling me that at approximately two years old, Les became seriously ill and his parents took him to Clifton Springs Hospital near Rochester. He walked into the hospital and came out of it unable to walk due to complications from what we now know was polio. He never left the wheelchair. Neither he nor anyone else ever considered his condition a disability. Although medical doctors told his parents he would probably not live past his teen years, Les fooled them. He lived to 73. He graduated from high school here in Clayton in 1933 as valedictorian of his class. Briefly, he followed his father into business in town with a tobacco shop. And in 1937, he set up a small space in the shop to use as a dark room and began processing film. He eventually decided to pursue a career in photography. Around 1945, he closed his photo developing business and with a friend, Bruce Bailey, went to New York City and attended the School of Modern Photography in New York City. That's his graduation diploma. The young men would study retouching, advanced and special studio lighting, and portraiture. They lived at the 63rd Street YMCA. Having a buddy from home with him was a great advantage as absolutely nothing was wheelchair accessible. After graduation, Les went to the West Coast to start a studio. 
He got a license to start the business there, but it never happened. His brother Howard called him with the news a building was for sale, downtown Clayton. He came back east as fast as a train would carry him. <laughs> Airlines did not accommodate anyone in a wheelchair either at that time. You had to be able to walk on board and walk off. He bought the Barker Block and opened his studio in January 1948, ready for business. Two years later, in 1950, he installed a $25,000 automated black and white film processor and adapted the floor space to accommodate a dark room, a printer, and an enlarger. In addition to walk-ins, portraits, weddings, publicities and scenic news, sports events, and school photos, he began servicing larger accounts such as Canada Steamship Lines, St. Lawrence Seaway, Chamber of Commerce and Pine Camp. And as we know, Pine Camp was renamed Camp Drum in 51 and then Fort Drum in 74. He married in 1958, Verda Scott Hutchinson, and she worked alongside of him until his death 30 years later in 1988. She continued the business with help from her family until she retired in 2013 at the age of 91. <laughs> the studio became well known for its immense collection of historical and regional images. Many authors such as Ian Corestein, Paul Malo, Lori Knowlton, Gil Mercer, Susan W. Smith, to name a few, all came to him requesting use of his collection, and he was only too happy to help them. The Pictorial History of the Thousand Islands, edited by Dr. Adrian Tenkai of Canada, is filled with his images and illustrates the international flavor of two great nations peacefully sharing their love of the Thousand Islands. Many of you remember Liz Falcom, I'm sure, <laughs> who ran the tour boat, the Island Princess, from the dock behind the studio. There was a time when Linz's friends strapped Les's wheelchair on the top of the Island Princess. <laughs> so Les could sit in it up there, tour the islands, and take photographs of the scenery. I wish I could have seen that. <laughs> <laughs> My husband remembers. Sorry, honey. <laughs> Les teaching him to use a four by five press camera when he was about 12 years old and told him to go take some photos. He was on Riverside Drive between McCormick's and Esther's place when he saw a woman down on the dock fishing. The wind caught her dress, <laughs> raised it, exposed her backside. <laughs> he was so caught up in watching, he forgot to take a photo. <laughs> when he returned back to the studio and told Les about it, Les laughed and said, you'll never be a photographer. <laughs> I'm sure all of you have stories about Les your own memories of him. Please take some time to enjoy photos on, and images on the wall here in the Opera House. This exhibit will be here for the entire year as Clayton celebrates its sesquicentennial. 
Thank you. take this off. With everything in life, there's paperwork. And uh, Marilyn, uh, I know that, uh, you know, you were apprehensive how I was going to call up across. You're a power speaker. What can I say? <laughs> you, you had me captivated right from the beginning. You know, uh, I never introduced myself as Tom LeClaire, the, uh, the Clayton historian. Uh, but when you have a gem of the community, and it's a husband and wife team, you listen closely. Because uh, I've been learning some things today. But uh, on behalf of the sesquicentennial uh, committee, again, the partnership, uh, we have a certificate of appreciation for being a sesquicentennial hatching over history speaker. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> and it's a, it's a small token for everything that we share today. So, thank you. And, and I'd like to thank, uh, I did a head count real quick. We're almost at 40 people, so it's a, it's a wonderful attendance. Uh, uh, you know, you might want to do this again at, some, at another location. So, thank you. Feel free to come on up, look at the uh, display, ask questions. But thank you for coming out to uh, today's Hashing Over History. Thank you.